Hi, I'm Ron Savage. Recently, I've been putting a few of my published short stories online for you to take a look at. Dylan, American Illustrator, Little Gypsies are all here. Today, I have a new one for you. This one is called Mr. Kabashi. Your mother is here with us, Matthew. This was what Mr. Kabashi said to his stepson as they were riding home from the funeral in a limousine. Mr. Kabashi sat on the edge of the back seat with a black lacquered cane poised end up between his knees. His small hands cupped the cane's gold handle. Japanese people believe the living and the dead depend on each other, he said in a soft voice. Mr. Kabashi smelled of clothes. He wore a dark pinstripe suit and a starched white shirt and black tie. Knowing our loved ones are always with us can bring great comfort, he said. Mr. Kabashi was a young man who talked like an old man. Matthew's mother had said that one night while watching television and drinking her whiskey and soda. She had gray eyes and her fingernails were filed to the skin and painted cherry red. Matthew's mother fixed extra drinks on Friday and Saturday nights. It's okay to treat myself, she would say. Mummy doesn't have to work tomorrow, right? His mother cut hair and gave perms and shampoos. Sometimes his mother fell asleep in front of the television and Matthew could not wake her up. He would shake her shoulder and slap his hands together next to her ear, but nothing worked. On those nights, Matthew knew his mother had died and he was alone. Mr. Kabashi patted the boy's back and said, Your mother was a gentle woman. We will build a shrine to keep her spirit with us. Matthew looked beyond the tinted window of the limousine. Tall crepe myrtles lined Granby Street's median. Fallen blossoms were pink in white islands on the dark grass. Matthew wanted to cry, but he was eight now. I thought crying was for first graders. I am braver than those boys, he thought. Matthew's mother had liked telling him that. You are the bravest boy I know, she used to say. Three days ago, his mother had driven their blue station wagon through the concrete guardrail off the Granby Street Bridge and into the Elizabeth River. The policeman told Mr. Kabashi, I doubt your missus suffered. Matthew did not believe his mother was dead. His mother could fool anybody she wanted to fool. He once listened to her recite all parts of their favorite Christmas movie. She liked doing that with the old black and white movies, too. The policeman had found some other dead person in their blue station wagon. Some other dead mother. Matthew's mother had gone to California on an airplane. She wanted to be a movie star. She wanted a real job that paid real money. Matthew slept in his own bed with the door almost closed and the light off. He did not look under the bed for monsters. Matthew thought he was too short and too skinny for his age and needed to act more grown up. You are my little hero, Matty. His mother would say that to Matthew after telling him one of her California bedtime stories. Matthew also thought he was too old for stories, but he liked watching his mother and listening to her. The stories uh, were about a scared mama and her brave son who go to California and get jobs in the movies where they can tap dance and sing. Many times the moon outlined his mother's curled dark hair and showed the freckles below her throat and on the sides of her slim neck. The night before his mother died, she had said, Takura is a very nervous man. He's very nervous about being a father. Takura was Mr. Kobashi's first name. 
Matthew could not imagine calling Mr. Kabashi anything but Mr. Kabashi. His mother was combing the front of Matthew's hair with her long fingers. Doesn't Mr. Kabashi have his own children, Matthew wanted to know? On this night, his mother's face was more in the shadows than the moonlight. Takura has an infection when he was a boy, she said. He cannot have his own children. Takura says he is honored you came into his life. An odor of cigarettes and lavender perfume clung to her white terry cloth bathrobe. Please try to be your most wonderful self, his mother said. Then she said, we have to help Takura feel at home. Matthew's mother and Mr. Kabashi had married last winter at Norfolk City Hall. Their photographs were in the Sunday Virginia Ledger bride and groom section. Mr. Kabashi had asked Matthew to carry the ring. Matthew did not remember his real father. Fathers belonged to other families. Fathers got in the way, he thought. Mr. Kabashi wanted too much adult time. He would say, this time is for mother and the father, Matthew. This is adult time. Mr. Kabashi said that every five minutes. Once his mother told Matthew that his real father was a drop-dead handsome man who liked to hit girls in their tummies and faces. She was watching television and drinking her second whiskey and soda. His mother's thin legs were crossed at the knee. She was tapping a white clary, uh, terry cloth slipper against her heel as she talked. Matthew's mother had been afraid of his real father. She lighted a cigarette with a plastic red lighter and told Matthew, One night I just scooped you from your crib and drove from Alabama to Virginia. Before Matthew's mother and Mr. Kobashi married, Matthew and his mother had to visit Mr. Kobashi's family in Miami Beach. The bride becomes the adopted daughter of our family, Mr. Kobashi said. Japanese people call the bride Hanayomi, a flower daughter. Mr. Kobashi's mother and father lived in a condominium next to the ocean. While curtains billowed in front of the open double glass doors that led from the living room to a brick patio with a wrought iron table, big umbrella and a barbecued grill, everything inside Mr. and Mrs. Kobashi's condominium smelled of the ocean and banana suntan cream. Matthew remembered Mrs. Kabashi looking at him and smiling. She would talk to Mama, but watch me, he thought. Mrs. Kabashi had tan, wrinkled skin and tiny white teeth. She would talk English to Matthew's mother, then talk Japanese to her husband. Her husband was a small, round man with a round, happy face and a round stomach and small, thick hands. The senior Mr. Kabashi sat in the shadowed corner of the room. He sat away from everyone and observed the conversation like a referee. He would grin at Matthew and Matthew's mother. The living room had a pine floor and a room-sized red, black, and white oriental rug. Large Japanese watercolors hung on the white walls. There were paintings of mountains and a sea with a purple and orange sunset. There were villages with little bamboo huts and people in straw hats and long black and white robes. What do you think of the Japanese people, the senior Mr. Kabashi said to Matthew. This was the first time the senior Mr. Kabashi had said anything. I like the ninjas on the television, Matthew had said. I take karate classes at our church after school. Matthew wanted to tell the senior, Mr. Kabashi, how he had broken two wood boards last week with his foot, but, has, but his mother had given him a look. The senior, Mr. Kabashi, laughed, and his round face got red and his eyes were thin slots. 
Americans love our ninjas and our cars, he said. Then he said, you are a very lucky man, Takuya. I too loved your mother. Don't think you are alone in your feelings. This was what Mr. Kabashi Jr. said in the back seat of the limousine as he slipped the shiny new loafers onto Matthew's stocking feet. Matthew's thin legs laid over Mr. Kabashi's knees. Besides the loafers, Mr. Kabashi had also bought Matthew a navy blue linen suit that came with short pants. What do you know about it? Matthew wanted to say. He wanted to say, you don't know anything about anything. My mother is getting a job in the movies. But instead of saying that, he said, I am not a Japanese boy. You are not my father. His legs curled away from Mr. Kobashi. He kicked one loafer off his stocking foot and onto the gray carpeted floor. Matthew turned and looked at the tinted window. He was eight now, and not a first grader, and not a second grader. He had saved $72.34 in a wide mouth jar on his bureau. Matthew bet a lot of boys bought airplane tickets by themselves. The limousine smelled of Mr. Kobashi's clove aftershave and leather from the gray leather seats. You do not have to be a Japanese boy, Mr. Kobashi said in a whisper. I know I am a stepfather, but here we are, you and I. Your mother has departed this world, and here we are, the two of us. Matthew stayed quiet. He looked through the tinted window as the limousine passed the row of shops on Ward's Corner. There was a sewing shop, a small department store, a shoe and bag emporium, and a music store painted in bright red and blue and yellow crayon colors. That was where Matthew's mother bought her Broadway show tunes and her black and white movies on DVDs. Matthew said, Mama is waiting for me in California. Matthew had paid $12.17 for a cherry Coke, large fries, and a hamburger with cheese. Airport food was very expensive and very bad, he thought. The food looked a lot better than it tasted. His fries were cold and hard, and he had to chew each fry over and over. Matthew was now adding up the numbers on his bill while the waitress stood next to him and sighed. Her arms were folded and her fingers tapped at her skinny bicep. The waitress had tangled gray-brown hair, and her uniform smelled of bacon. You got the money or what, she said. His trip to the airport had been expensive, too. The trip took almost an hour, and he had to come to, and it had come to $31.30. Matthew's cab driver liked to talk. He said he was a second-year student at Norfolk Community College, and he bet Matthew would be stunned to know the price of a school book. The young driver had a smooth face and slick back blonde hair. His clothes had an odor of burning leaves. He said people usually gave him the cab fare and $10 extra for driving safe and for arriving at the airport early enough to check their luggage onto the plane. Matthew counted out the money for the cab fare and the $10 tip. The driver told him, you have a blessed evening. The waitress with the gray tangled hair was still waiting on Matthew. These are all my customers, kiddo, she said in, in this, uh, and waved her hand about the small food court with its booths and round tables. There were five people in the food court beside Matthew, two couples and a fat teenage girl in a green velour jogging suit. The waitress had bony hands and her fingernails were painted the same cherry red as his mother's nails. Seeing the waitress's fingernails 
brought an empty feeling to Matthew's chest, but he did not know why. I am an extremely busy person, the waitress said. Matthew had his change and his dollar bills on the polished dark wood tabletop. He was counting out the twelve dollars in singles. Matthew did not like Norfolk International. The airport had too many signs saying too many things. There were big blue screens that listed cities. Tall ceilings disappeared into white fluorescent lights. Disinfectant mixed with the odors of burgers and pizza and chicken. Matthew kept his tan canvas knapsack tucked under his arm. He wore his shiny loafers and the new navy blue linen suit with the short pants that Mr. Kabashi had bought him yesterday for the funeral. People were hurrying everywhere. Why are they here at night, he thought. Are they going to California? Matthew had called a cab after Mr. Kabashi was asleep. When the cab left him at the airport, the time was close to 10. Matthew had never been out this late by himself. The waitress folded Matthew's money into the pocket of her wrinkled white apron and told him, Don't forget the tip, kiddo. A couple of dollars will do. I am too old a girl to pay the rent with my looks, she said. Matthew had his money spread on the table. What he had left from his $72.34 was two tens, a five, a one, and change. Matthew did not know how much an airplane ticket to California costs, but he knew it was a lot more than that. He knew a cab home costs more than that. After returning from the funeral, Mr. Kabashi had built a Shinto shrine in the corner of the living room. He covered a small mahogany end table with white silk cloth. There were two wood bowls filled with oranges, apples, and limes. A photograph of Matthew's mom was at the center of the table and draped in purple and white ribbons. Mr. Kabashi had bought purple uh, irises and white carnations to place around the bottom of the photograph. Would you like to help honor your mother? Mr. Kabashi said this to Matthew, who sat on the beige sectional sofa looking at him. Build a shrine is, building a shrine is how Japanese people show their devotion, Mr. Kabashi had said. He was arranging the purple and white flowers as he talked. One day I will do this for my father and his family. Mr. Kabashi uh, used his pocket handkerchief to wipe the dust from a photograph. And many years from now, you will hopefully build a shrine for me, he said. And your son for you, of course. Do you see how it works? the fathers and the sons. Matthew had thrown the two bowls of fruit against the white walls. He watched himself do it. He watched himself as if he were watching his twin brother. Oranges, apples, and limes scattered across the living room like scared animals. No, no, he said. I am not a Japanese boy, he said. Matthew had pulled the white silk cloth from the mahogany end table. The heel of his new loafer cracked the glass of the photograph. His heel cracked the photograph a second time and a third. No, no, he said, and pulled away the purple and white ribbons from the silver frame and the broken glass and the smiling photograph of his mother. No, no, he said, and crushed the purple irises and the white carnations inside his fists. I am not a Japanese boy, he said, and rolled the crushed flowers between his palms until the petals became tiny colorless balls that fell and hit the floor without a sound. The people who waited for the airplanes at Norfolk International smelled like old socks. Or like the gym at Granby Elementary, Matthew thought. 
They sat in rows of orange plastic chairs. Suitcases lay on the thready carpet next to their feet or in the empty chair beside them. Some people were sleeping with their mouths open. Some people were reading magazines or newspapers or paperback books. Everybody who was not sleeping looked tired. Matthew lay on one of the plastic chairs in front of the dark window that overlooked the runway, his legs cross and armrests. He was watching the airplanes leave the ground and fly into the night, yellow lights flashing on tails and wings. Faces were looking at him from luminous portholes. Matthew had wondered if the faces in the portholes were going to California. This is not your night to travel, Mr. Kobashi said and seated himself beside his stepson. He also looked at the runway through the dark window. Your taxi driver came back to our house and wanted to know if I had sent you off on your own, Mr. Kobashi said. I told him I would never do that. I told him you were a very strong boy with your own thoughts. I told him you had the bravest of hearts. But I would never send you off on your own, Mr. Kobashi said. I was very emphatic about it. I told him I would never do that. Matthew shifted in the orange plastic chair and leaned his arm against the crease sleeve of Mr. Kobashi's pinstripe suit coat. Matthew breathed in the smell of the clothed aftershave. I am very honored you are in my life, Mr. Kabashi said. His voice had that familiar soft tone. Mr. Kabashi covered the top of Matthew's hand with his palm. You do not have to be a Japanese boy, he said. We are both new at this, he said. On the other side of the large dark window, an airplane was rising into the night. The moon drifted through thin white clouds. Yellow lights rotated and flashed along the plane's wings, along its graceful tail. And many faces looked down from their luminous portholes. Thank you.